live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California. It's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Welcome back, everybody. This is theCUBE. We're live here at Big Data SV 2015 in San Jose, California. I'm Jeff Kelly with Wikibon. I'm joined by my co-host, Jeff Frick. Uh, in this segment, we're, gonna, we're joined by Kyoto Tamura, who is the Director of Marketing at Treasure Data. Welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on theCUBE, first time guest. Um, so tell us a little bit about Treasure Data. We've, we've spoken with you guys before, but I think it would be valuable for audience for you to kind of give a, give a good overview. What's Treasure Data all about? Sure, so Treasure Data was started with a vision that we want to make data accessible for everyone by building a truly end-to-end -end cloud based uh, analytics infrastructure for all kinds of data. Uh, we started the company in December 2011 and we just raised Series B uh, last month and I've been with the company since May of 2012 it's been quite a journey for mm -hmm. me. And you've worn, we were talking off camera, you've worn quite a few different hats uh, inside, yeah, uh, inside absolutely. of Treasure Data. Absolutely, I've done everything from customer support, sales engineering and my, my pitch to people is that uh, you can ask me anything about a company other than fundraising <laughs> and R&D. Because if I wrote the code, we wouldn't be around. We wouldn't have raised seriously. <laughs> yeah. okay, got it. So, uh, so tell us a, a little bit more about kind of the, the platform. You mentioned cloud-based, which is um, you know bringing together two of the biggest things we talk about on the cube all the time: cloud and big yeah. data. Um, walk through some of the use cases, kind of what uh, what you really designed, what the platform's really sure. designed to handle. So uh, we consider like there are three pain points when you try to uh, kick off big data projects or data analytics uh, initiative. One is collecting data from various sources. Uh, a lot of times people talk about big data, uh, they talk about volume. Volume is a very important concern, I'm gonna touch on that. But also like the variety of data you need to collect, right? If you're an e-commerce company, there's mobile apps, there's an in-store POS data, and there's a big web servers with multiple properties. A lot of times the pain point is that those are in different data silos and the data analysts and data scientists, they can't access it in a way that is productive. So we solve this problem with our data collection agent as well as like mobile SDKs and like web SDKs. And this ensures that the, all, the, all kinds of data are coming to treasure data in a reliable and streaming manner. Uh, and for the storage layer, we built our uh, own uh, highly fault tolerant, uh, highly compressed columnar storage. Internally, we dub it Plasma. And we run that on the cloud today, and that's what stores our customers' data very, very uh, efficiently. Mm -hmm. And finally, like a lot of times, uh, people buy all sorts of big data storage systems, and that does exactly just that, like store the data. And one number that I heard is only like 15, 20% of that data is effectively utilized. Uh, we solve that problem by providing a uh, uniform SQL interface so if you're like a skill type data analyst or data scientist who want to uh, pre-process the data before they actually get to the meat of it, there's that interface. We also understand that a lot of BI people want connectivity to the tools that they're familiar with. So we provide the ability to integrate with existing BI tools as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, things like Tableau and other sure. other, yeah. other tools. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about um, kind of what your customers are doing with your platform because sure. I think you know one of the themes we've talked about all week, Jeff, is moving from talking about the technology and kind of the, the framework to hey, what are we actually going to do with all this data? Yeah. Um, so let me back up. Is that a theme that you're, you're hearing as well this week at the show? Absolutely. And, and talk a little bit about how your customers are actually executing on that. Sure. Uh, one big uh, customer that we have who is now big, but who started out very small with us, mm -hmm. is this uh, e-commerce platform called Wish.com. They're the world's largest uh, mobile shopping mall. And what's interesting with Wish is that uh, their, their co-founder, Danny Zan, is a Hadoop veteran. He worked at Yahoo where he built a big um, Hadoop cluster. And he totally understood the value of doing all that work is if you can actually mine insights from your data. But, and if you're at a big company with a lot of engineering resources, you know, build versus buy is an interesting proposition. It's a no-brainer when you're starting a new e-commerce platform. So Wish started with us almost three years ago now, and initially they're a small company, right? But now that the, 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 they're the world's largest uh, mobile uh, shopping mall, they do a lot of number crunching, and a lot of that happens on us. And it, it was interesting, and it was very, uh, it really validated our value prop that they could start small, but grow as they need it. 
uh, with treasure data was really um, like it, it really made my day when like you know Danny told me that. Mm -hmm. So what if you could drill down a little bit, right? Because the world would probably say we don't need another e-commerce platform, right? E-commerce has been going on forever. So what was either the vision that he had or what he actually realized once he got to work yeah. and had the data that enabled him to use data in a way to build an application in the space that most would think is mature and actually take a market leading yeah. position. Yeah. So th th there's a bunch of tools uh, specifically tailored for like e-commerce people do the analytics. But a lot of these solutions do not allow them raw access to the data. So the, the way that Wish is structured is that they have their own uh, homegrown A-B testing system and they know a lot about that, like how to do A-B testing with multiple like hypotheses at the same time. But what in order to actually make that happen, they need to have a very, very robust data infrastructure that powers it, right? Um, the analogy that I give is like, imagine like an iceberg. What people see is the end result, which is that only like 5% of what's actually happening on, like underneath. And we try to be that like really robust uh, part that not that many people actually see, but so that people like truly shine doing the 5% that they, other people can actually see. So put treasure data in context, we're here at Hadoop world, yep. uh, there's a lot of vendors out there on the floor. Yeah. Um, it sounds like what you're, you're trying to abstract away a lot of that complexity that's yes. inherent in, in deploying some of these technologies in your own data center, um, cobbling together different pieces from, from different vendors, et cetera. Um, when you go out into the field and you're, you're, you're fighting tooth and nail for customers, I'm sure with all the other players out there, where do you, where do you find, who do you find yourself going up against? Could you help us kind of understand what, for lack of a better term, what bucket you, would, you, you, you tend to fall in. Are you, are you in not at your own bucket, perhaps? Yeah. So one, one group of people is who has this uh, perception that the cloud is too new or like they can do it themselves uh, using their own like what I call like a Lego blocks of various uh, data services. And what we notice is that it does work, but uh, in many cases, but the, the, the opportunity cost of like not being able to utilize engineering resources or engineering talent, which all know by now, is very, very scarce in this ecosystem today, is actually a huge loss for them. And by far, like the, the customers that we see who are tr our true champions are people who have sort of seen that in one way or another. And they came to the conclusion that if, if their main business is data, maybe it is worth the investment. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's maybe. If their main business is outside of data, where data really empowers the product and business decisions, it's better to have something that is already built that suits their purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's interesting because we talk a lot about the kind of born data driven startups and you know, that's kind of some of the, the d big data is born in their DNA. Yeah. But then you've got this whole wide swath of companies in the enterprise beyond those Fortune 1000 who are, you know, they're kicking the tires with Hadoop and they're doing some yeah. things with Hadoop, but you've got this huge uh, market opportunity with all these other companies that don't necessarily have the skills internally and don't want to be in the business of putting together these technologies where um, it sounds like that's kind of the market you're trying to address. Yeah, and also within like Fortune 1000, what, what we're seeing is that there are new projects where they really want to test out ideas quickly, but in order to like mobilize their internal resources, it's going to take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So we uh, work with the Pioneer today for their new I IoT initiatives. So what they wanted to do is that they want to go from just selling onboard diagnostic devices to actually making that data that is generated already by collecting it effectively and providing it in a consumable format to various third parties and themselves. And it was really eye-opening for me because I don't come from the telematics background and it's really amazing what kind of analysis can be done once you can actually collect all the data that is being generated inside a car today. Mm -hmm. and, and opening that up to, to data scientists and other analysts. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Talk about um, using cloud as a data collection repository from disparate and distributed sets of data. Because I'm sure a lot of people, uh, that, that might scare them, A, for security and those types of reasons, but also just p potentially the scale. Um, but talk about the trade-off of what using the cloud as your repository enables you to do with these disparate sources, disparate data sets. Yeah, so we do understand that, you know, different sovereignties have different rules uh, that govern the, how data should be treated. And this is actually where our open source project called FluentD has been really helpful. So FluentD, you can think of it as like a logging middleware that allows you to stream data from point A to Z. But also uh, baked into its feature set is um, the filtering mechanism, which allows people to uh, simply get rid of certain fields or encrypt it 
or hash it so that it's very hard to tr trace back to what the original value is. And this actually gives our customer the confidence that, okay, if we use, decide to go with treasure data, I can always call, keep the master copy in our, uh, on our premises and also do the filtering so that we can ensure, like programmatically, that only the data that can be on the public cloud goes to treasure. Interesting. So. Um, I'm curious to get your perspective from, as, you, as we talked about earlier, you've done a lot of different roles within Treasure Data. Yeah. Um, you know, you guys are a fairly young company. Uh, and we have a lot of, a lot of our viewers are entrepreneurs and in the startup world as well. What are some of the lessons you've learned? Um, maybe some the hard way, uh, you know, in terms of building a company Talk uh, in to space. the customers. <laughs> Talk to the customers. Uh, especially, like, our CTO cause comes from, like, a deep Hadoop background. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he's a Japanese native. If you type in his name, uh, autocomplete sometimes is Hadoop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we knew that we knew our crowd, right? <laughs> but then like we started to talk to customers or to prospects, like why are you buying treasure data? Like what are the terms that you entered to Google? And it's really eye-opening every time. Sometimes they are not even looking for big data. They were looking for ways to store their, their logs more effectively. And they ran into like a Wikipedia page and that's how they landed on us. Sometimes they, we didn't even know that they tried us before, but they went to a different company where the man management is more receptive to the, uh, to the idea of using cloud. And that, so finally they're signing up and giving us money. Mm -hmm. And it's talk to the customers. Mm -hmm. It's lesson number one. That's, I think it's a good lesson, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Well, the other kind of big trend that we know, you know, another wave is coming and it's the Internet of Things and the yes. industrial Internet. And uh, now all these connected devices throwing off tons, tons more data. Yeah. Talk a little bit about you know your guys' point of view on it. I'm sure very excited about Internet of Things and some of the things you're doing to take advantage yeah. of that opportunity. What's coming just around the corner? Yeah. So the big challenge in the industrial Internet of Things is making sure that you have the mechanism to collect the data that is being generated. Uh, a lot of it is actually um, two things. One is the platforms are still um, pretty fragmented. Um, it's not like you know Linux servers where you can just write for one platform and pretty much cover like half the market. That's not how it works. The other thing is that I think a lot of companies are still trying to figure out how they can utilize that data. But there's a lot of high-level discussion. But what what really like convinced Pioneer to go with us is that they had a very clear vision themselves as to how they can utilize that data being generated, and. I think that's going to be what the 2015 really is for. And I, my, my, my somewhat far-fetched hypothesis is that they can also learn from the other kind of Internet of Things crowd, which is like wearables and more new, like newer companies that are coming from the like entrepreneurial space. Right. Mm -hmm. And on, you said they had a pretty clear defined vision. Um, did that pan out? I'm just curious once they kind of, you know, as they say, you know, the yeah. perfect plan until the first shot is fired. You know, yeah. did it work out the way so they thought? Or, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can talk about the timeline part, yeah. but it's definitely going well. Um, there's commits uh, in our private repo happening every day. So, good. so um, just got time for one more question. So sure. I'll ask you, what's, what's on your roadmap to the extent you can share in terms of the next year? What's top of mind for you, your major focus? Yeah, Azure so uh, I'm sure you guys already noticed this, but there's been a lot more interest on what to do with the data that you're collecting, like big data you're collecting, then creating the platform to store and like process big data, like just like last year, right? Mm -hmm. And once like once we have all the infrastructure pieces and services that uh, allow people to focus on the analysis, it's very important that the analysis that the data scientists and data analysts do actually make it back to production by operationalizing a lot of their findings. And this is also where we're uh, really focusing on in 2015 and 2016, because at the end of the day, it is one thing to see the data and say, aha, like we find something new. But the next really important step is, let's actually implement something that uses our insights and automate it. And I'm really hopeful that it's going to happen this I year. I agree. You know, I think that's for me, that's where it starts to get exciting. You're actually doing stuff with all this data and, and impacting business, impacting society. We heard earlier some, some use cases around climate change. So there's a lot of things uh, that I think are going to happen this year, and it's going to be pretty exciting. Yep. Uh, so, Kyoto, thanks so much for joining us on theCUBE. We appreciate it. Uh, everybody, thanks for watching. Stick around. We'll be right back with our next segment here live at Big Data SV after this.